This is WCNY's The Capitol Press Room, and we're going to peel back the curtain on the legislative process in Albany to shed some light on efforts to pass a controversial bill intended to curb single-use plastic packaging in New York. The proposal, which aims to gradually reduce plastic packaging over a number of years, has been kicking around the Capitol for a couple of years, but got its first floor vote in the state Senate in the waning days of the legislative session in June. Ultimately, though, the Assembly never got around to voting on the measure before departing Albany for now. To understand what happened, our other podcast, Dispatches from Planet Albany, spoke with Senate Environmental Conservation Committee Chair Pete Harcum, a Westchester County Democrat who sponsored the legislation. Here is an excerpt of that conversation. So I'm old enough to remember when Governor Hochul's executive budget proposal included uh, the Waste Reduction and Recycling Infrastructure Act. Um, Where was the second floor on this issue this year, though? Because it seemed like it was left solely to the Assembly and Senate to hash out uh, extended producer responsibility as it pertained to single-use plastic packaging waste. Well, we're responsible for what we do in the Senate and in the legislature. You know, the governor has always said she's supportive of an EPR bill. If you remember, her bill was much more conservative than our approach was. And, you know, the hope was that we could tailor something uh, that could get to her desk from both houses and either she would sign or or we would go into negotiations on chapter amendments. But what we control is what we control, and that, that's the New York State Senate. Well, do you feel like the governor or her legislative team could have been helpful during this process, or do you think it's for the best that they were largely not part of this conversation? I think their feeling was because the legislature didn't necessarily engage her proposal two years ago, you know, her feeling was, okay, then you come up with a solution and then we'll we'll go from there. You know, I mean, the drama is always the tit for tat, who said what, who did this. You know, it's really my responsibility is to develop and push my legislation and create consensus around that. And so that's that's what I was focused on this year. But theoretically, the governor has a bully pulpit that you or Assemblymember Glick or even the entire Senate and Assembly chambers can't really match. So the governor theoretically could do a barnstorming tour around the state to change hearts and minds about uh, this issue. She could theoretically work uh, behind the scenes to change uh, policymakers. Do you think any of that could have made a difference? Number one, I I don't think that happens very frequently. I think social media bill is an example. Right. That was that was one bill out of over 900. Yeah. You know, I, I see where you're going, and I'm not trying to be difficult, but I, I don't want to speculate on what other people may or may not do. I can only control my own universe, and that's what I'm responsible and should be held accountable for. So dating back to 2023, you and I had talked about the process of amending this bill and how you had made a concentrated effort to work with your assembly counterpart, uh, Deborah Glick. How did that impact the timing of this process? Because, for example, the Senate didn't pass this bill until the final days of the legislative session. And I'm curious if that effort to remain in lockstep with each other meant that things took longer. I think it's important if you're trying to get a law done to be in lockstep as best you can be. We had a wonderful partnership in the in the final Two weeks of session, we had some great negotiations. Our friends in the assembly were were great partners, made great suggestions, um, were great negotiators. We came up at the end with a bill that the advocates still believed would make a difference, that many in industry had, had told us there were aspects in there that they were looking for relief on, and we gave them relief on. After the budget was late, you know, the majority of the bills that get passed that are new and meaningful bills happen in the last week or two of session. And so I'm proud we got it done in the in the, in the Senate. The Assembly is a different chamber. They've got more members. They've got different process. So, you know, we got it done in, in the Senate. We planted a flag in the ground for next year for the partners in industry who were really responsibly working with us in good faith. We we addressed a, a lot of their concerns. 
We went back to the PRO that they wanted. We reduced the content reduction from 50% to 30%. We allowed them to have the reductions across their company line rather than on a product by product by product basis. Um, so we really did address a lot of their concerns. And I think we enter next year um, in a very different place and we started uh, the session. Well, when did you know that your bill was going to get a vote in the state Senate? You know, first was a few weeks before I had a conversation with leadership. They wanted to know where we were and what resources we needed. That's when not just Environment Council worked with us, but, you know, central staff really got involved in the negotiation. So when we had the backing of leadership, you know, as long as I felt we could get a deal done with our friends in the assembly, that we were going to get a vote on this. I, I knew I had the votes. That's rule number one, count your vote. I thank our members who held strong in, in the wake of turbulent pressure at, at the very end. But I felt as long as as long as we could cut a deal with the Assembly, we would get a vote in the Senate. And we did cut a deal uh, with our partners in the Assembly. And, and maybe it was a little closer to the, the finish line than, than any of us would have liked. But uh, I'm glad we got it done. And I, I think it sets us up for a good good start to next session. Well, it's interesting to hear you lay out that timeline and what pieces that you had to have in play, specifically the the majority of, of votes, because going back to when the bill finally got amended, it sounds like those amendments weren't crucial to the passage of this bill through the state Senate. It sounds more like you had support in your chamber and you had to find something that both houses could agree upon before it could actually be brought up for a vote. It sounds like there wasn't going to be a vote until both you and Assemblymember Glick found a bill that you both liked. Well, we we had had concerns. So, for instance, the, the ag concerns came to us from several of our members who represent agricultural districts or have agricultural portions of their district. So that was something that we wanted to address for members. We had members who had certain packaging companies. We put in a manufacturing tax credit because we knew some of this was going to cost companies money. That resulted from a visit I made to a colleague's district and visited a cardboard manufacturing plant in their district. Uh, and they told us how expensive new equipment was going to be. And so we made that change. I heard that firsthand up in a college district. So honestly, you know, they, they, there's always like the intrigue of like what the Senate was going to do, what the assembly was going to do. You know, and the reality is I, I've got to do the best bill that I can. And I wanted to get a bill that was passable in both houses and that we could get to the governor for serious consideration. And, and I think we did that. When did it become clear to you that the assembly version of this bill, which got sent to the floor a couple of days uh, before they gaveled out for the scheduled end of session, that it wouldn't be coming up for a vote? And how did you find out? We were in direct contact with, with our colleagues. And, you know, we thought that they, like us, would be at the very end. But you know, they, they have less capacity in their runway because their debates are longer mm -hmm. and they have more members. So the clock ran out, unfortunately. Over the summer, we'll speak with our friends in, in the assembly. We'll speak with stakeholders and, and we'll see, you know, where we go when we get back in a session in January. Did Assemblymember Glick ask you to do any lobbying or any sort of hand-holding with assembly members, maybe fellow Westchester members or uh, more upstate members? Was there an no, argument? Let's you know, deploy I Pete was, Harcum. I was, I was focused on the Senate, you know, because I knew I had my debate coming up. We were doing debate prep and I was just doing the head count in the Senate. The final tally in the Senate was 37 to 23, with a handful of Democrats voting against the measure. Were those votes a surprise when they were tallied up, or did you get a heads up from your Democratic colleagues that they wouldn't be supporting this? No, you know, the reality is we, we passed it by a comfortable majority. Yeah. So, you know, I'm not going to begrudge people who 
don't vote for a particular bill, right? But, but were there votes of surprise? Did they tell you in advance, hey, you know, I hope you have the vote somewhere else because it's, I'm not going to be one of them? I, I don't discuss what we discuss in, in conference, but I there were no surprises. As, and my father used to say in ping pong, you only have to get it over the net one more time than your opponent. And and it was a lot more than one vote. You know, we had a com- comfortable margin. You know, I'm proud of the members who who voted for this because, you know, there was unrelenting pressure in, in the last two weeks of session. There probably wasn't a lobbyist in Albany who wasn't who wasn't working on this issue and i i thank my colleagues for you know sticking to the facts and staying true and you appreciate the folks who are there with you on a vote not necessarily focus negatively on the ones who aren't you know people have to do what they've got to do with the different versions of the bill you had different members signed on as co-sponsors and jumping on and off the bill, uh, one of which was a Republican member, Long Islander uh, Anthony Palumbo, who was on the final version of the bill but ended up voting against the measure on the floor. What do you make of something like that? I I don't. (laughs) No? You don't want to weigh in? No, I mean, you'd you'd have to ask him. You know, again, I I focus on the fact that that you know, we got the bill passed and we got a bill passed by by a comfortable margin. And then, you know, when we get into next year, we'll discuss with members who may have had concerns, what their concerns were. And we'll we'll see if there are ways in the bill that we, we can address those concerns. Is there a reason to amend the bill at this point, given the fact that you've already shown you've got a majority, more than a majority who are willing to vote for this? So why not just leave the bill as it is for 2025 and now you've got six months for the assembly to bring it up? Well, you know, it's it's always an iterative process. So if we learn new things in, in the interim, I mean, quite honestly, in the next couple months, I'm going to be more focused on my campaign uh, than legislation for next year. So, you know, we'll, 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 we'll have a little time to think about it. But I think we always need to keep an open mind on legislation. It's always an iterative process. And so if folks come to us with, with good ideas or um, things we might have missed, I'm, I'm always open to that. that. That's how I operate. But, you know, as, as we opened with, I think, and to your point, we're starting at a very good place because we, we have a bill that addressed a lot of concerns and that was passed by a comfortable uh, number of votes in the Senate. Well, now that you've reached this point, do you think it is ripe for inclusion in the state budget, potentially? Yeah, but that's that's a process issue. If we go back two years ago, I, I would have been happy to have addressed it in, in the state budget. We we had a version in, in our one house. But, you know, that will be the strategy that we'll talk about as we get into the fall uh, and as we get into into January. You know, we'll we'll chat with, with Deb, we'll chat with advocates, and, and we'll see you know, how we want to proceed with this to tactically have the best advantage to getting something across the line. And that was an excerpt of our Dispatches from Planet Albany conversation with Senate Environmental Conservation Committee Chair Pete Harcum, a Westchester County Democrat who sponsored the extended producer responsibility legislation dealing with single-use plastic packaging. Support for the Capitol Press Room provided by Beyond Plastics, which supports the Packaging Reduction and Recycling Infrastructure Act, working to cut plastic packaging in half. Plastics that cannot be recycled end up burned in incinerators, buried in landfills, or polluting rivers and the oceans. More information at beyondplastics.org.